Yo, what's up, friends? Uh, in this video, I decided I was going to take uh, 10 characters that I've uh, voice acted in the past and uh, just kind of reflect on them, maybe talk about, like, how I came up with the voice or any fun facts I had uh, while recording, uh, that sort of thing. Um, I also uh, asked you guys on Twitter for any questions you had about specific characters, uh, and I got some pretty good questions. I may actually do a, a different, a separate video just kind of answering more general voiceover questions. Uh, but yeah, let's just get down to it. Silence, wife! Keep your treacherous tongue lest I cut it from your mouth. So, assassin, my cow-eyed queen may have set you loose on my siblings, my children. So I think I've told this story before uh, in the past, but uh, Zeus in Apotheon is the first professional voiceover role I ever had. Basically, back then, I was an aspiring voice actor, and I, I'd always wanted to voice act, and had been, I've had been like actively trying to get to that point. Um, and I was familiar with uh, the work of Devin Mack, who uh, directed the uh, voice cast in a game called Dust and Legion Tale. I was familiar with him. I he'd always been someone. I was like, oh, that'd be cool to work with him. But I never thought it would ever actually happen. Then, funnily enough, uh, out of nowhere, I got an email from him to audition for Apotheon. And the way that he found me was he actually... This was way before YouTube took off or no, anybody knew who I was. Uh, but he had found me because I had done, like, Professor Layton uh, fan videos on my channel. And uh, he had been looking for someone who could either do a Professor Layton voice or something in that range... And he didn't contact me at that time, but he kept me in the back of his mind. And so getting this audition out of nowhere, it was a big fucking deal for me. I was like, holy shit. I was very excited. Uh, he sent me sides for not the character I ended up booking, funnily enough. It was, I forget which characters I got. Um, I auditioned for both anyway. And then he was like, I'd like to actually give you the main role of Zeus, the main villain, uh, based off your performances. Uh, that's one thing that's interesting in this business is sometimes you'll audition for a character and then you'll receive a completely different role based off your performance in the audition. Now, if I'm being totally honest, when I listen back to Zeus, I feel like now oh, I could I could now do this so much better, I guess. But at the same time, I also listen back with a lot of fondness because this was I was very nervous, very excited. Uh, it was, you know, a big role for me. I mean, I had never worked at all, and so to land uh, such an interesting, you know, big role in a game like this was, you know, crazy to me. I also definitely got sick uh, because uh, after the set, or because during the session, um, you fight Zeus in the game, and there's battle, battle stuff. So there's a lot of like yelling and getting stabbed. And I had never done anything like that before. And I definitely did not understand, like, my limits and how to, like, control that sort of thing. So I went too hard, blew my voice out, and I actually got a cold uh, afterwards. It's funny looking back on that because now I do battle stuff all the time. No problem. It's, like, uh, almost effortless. But back then, it took a lot out of me. And, uh... It's just kind of funny to look back on that and remember that. Still very thankful to Devin for giving me the opportunity. I think a lot of how I got my start was, you know, a huge thank, thanks to him for, you know, giving me a chance um, because a lot of this business is, you know, getting referred to others. And without that start, you know, I, it would have been hard, I think, to, to really break in. So I, I owe a lot to him. And he was also a great director on that project. Also, that baseline Zeus voice, that regal voice, has definitely uh, popped up in different roles and just different tweaks uh, here and there. Um, I get asked to voice kings and gods and all sorts of grand figures, and they're all going to fall sort of in that range. Some pretty huh? slick jacksy maneuvers you two got there. Not bad. For a bunch of amateurs... Welcome to the Wackiest Jaxies Under the Heavens Tournament. I see a few familiar faces in the crowd. So, OKKO OK was the first big cartoon gig I ever landed. And uh, I 
was very nervous. I had I was actually not living in California at the time, so I had to fly out uh, for the record. As far as how I was got involved with OKKO, um, I, I believe my name was thrown out there by the storyboarders uh, for a previous episode um, to potentially do a voice, and it obviously never happened. But I guess my name was somewhere in the mix of where can we fit him? Where can we bring him in for? And then this episode, Wacky Jacks, came about, and uh, my friend Dave, who was one of the storyboarders of that episode, he was instrumental in sort of going, hey, let's bring in someone for this one, because I think he'd do a really good job. Um, and I gotta say, it was an, one of my favorite records I've ever done. Uh, Johnny's voice, uh, they act, so they gave me a lot of, they gave me total freedom on how the characters would sound. They actually didn't uh, request anything. Uh, in fact, when I came in, I remember Ian actually going, maybe a Kuwabara type voice for Johnny, uh, from Yu Yu Hakusho. But I had a completely different voice in mind. As soon as I saw the design, I was like, I need him to have that, that shit-eating sort of voice. Yeah, from, from an anime dub from the 90s. And I think once, uh, they heard it, they were like, uh, yeah, no, that absolutely works. Uh, as far as Jack Wacky went, uh, that's definitely me, uh, taking, like, a Maximilian Pegasus sort of voice, but really exaggerating it, so, ooh, that sort of voice. Uh, almost more kind of like a James from Pokemon, kind of, like, in terms of that exaggerated sort of voice. And I gotta say, uh, that episode has a lot of me in it, because it's not just Johnny, it's not just Jack Wacky, there's also... The randos who are the big muscle-bound guys. Uh, I voiced a couple of those. So if you listen to that episode, I, I'm also, spoilers, Johnny's brother at the end. Because it turns out there's a whole thing. Uh, so a lot of that episode was me. And it was quite a first episode of animation to record. Also, I watched OKKO uh, before I came in. And I was very thrilled to get to do a sorry because uh, in that show they always say so sorry is sorry. Uh, that was an honor. Definitely still one of my fondest um, memories looking back uh, recording. And I, I'm always going to be very thankful to Ian and the crew for uh, taking a chance on me and bringing me in for that. Because I, it was just a great experience. This is uncomfortable, but according to my information, your debt has soared to heights once considered quite impossible. Master Lord Majesty is a fun one. Uh, Caitlin Glass asked me to audition for the character, and um, the uh, Japanese voice sounds pretty different. Uh, it's Kape Yamaguchi doing a um, very sort of like, how do, you, how do you even describe it? A cat-like uh, nya voice, I guess? He, I think he does the same voice uh, as Teddy in Persona 4. Um, and instead of trying to copy that, because first of all, I don't think I do a very good job, uh, but also, I looked at the character and went, what, in my mind, what would my take on this character sound like? And to me, Master Lord Majesty has a sort of, ooh, sort of regal edge to him, and a higher voice, very cartoony, but also... Kind of a little shit eater as well. Definitely a little inspiration of like a Meowth or something like that. Um, but uh, what I love about that character is he's got a lot of fun sides to him. Like he's got that very cutesy sort of side to him. But he's also very devious uh, and, you know, sort of manipulative. Really, really fun character to play. And this was also my first anime dub, which I had not done anime dubs up to that point. Uh, and the looping process is, you know, fascinating. Basically, when you dub an anime, uh, before each scene, you get three beeps of boop, 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 and then you go. Uh, and you gotta match the lip flaps, uh, which, by the way, the, uh, the, uh, localized, the, the script writers for anime dubs, wow, do they put in a lot of effort, because you have to match those flaps and make sure the dialogue sounds, you know, first off, like, make it makes sense and then it has to sound good if you're lucky radiant in particular was a lot of fun because that was uh aaron dismuke uh did the script for that and filled the character with a lot of cat puns which was really funny 
Um, this was, it was just an absolute delight and Caitlin was wonderful to work with. But I remember being pretty nervous because I had never dubbed anything before. I had done voiceover, you know, prelay plenty of times. Um, but matching, uh, you know, voice to picture like that was something I was not very experienced in. Uh, and I think it really helped that Caitlin was sort of my first director in that regard because she was very understanding, very like, uh, uh, and, I, and, I, and to be fair, I think I actually caught it, caught on pretty quickly. But uh, so one of, she's one of the nicest, you know, people ever. So to have that sort of like comforting presence was definitely a, a plus in my camp. And you know, I don't do a ton of anime, but uh, uh, since I've done uh, I've done Legend of the Galactic Heroes and Agretsuko, uh dubbing is challenging, but pretty fun. Like, I actually do enjoy the process quite a bit. There's, it's just this art form of like, okay, you listen to the Japanese, you listen to the beats, and go, okay, how do I translate that into English very quickly in my head, in terms of mouth flaps? I mean, which first off, I mean, this, again, credit to the scriptwriters, they, they make sure the dialogue fits the flaps, and they do almost a scary good job of that. So the work has been done for you. Then it's just a matter of you trying to deliver it and convey, you know, the right emotion. Uh, there's a lot to juggle, and it's actually kind of a lot of fun. What's also fun about dubbing is that you get to see the finished picture, which is not something you get all the time. You, oftentimes you're just looking at an Excel sheet. <laughs> uh, so getting to actually see the finished animation uh, can actually help you uh, really understand a scene, which is, which is really nice. Most humans are frail and weak, but you've got an admirable heft, girl. I know your pain, little friend. I will assist you. Flack, I think you could probably argue, is the most well-known performance of mine from Borderlands 3. Uh, I auditioned for them uh, a while before I actually recorded, and I, rec and I auditioned for several different characters, actually, but Flack was the one I ended up booking. What's funny is I believe the writers asked Joel to submit the auditions to me, and he was... Joel, by the way, is the, the voice director, and he's, he's great. Um, but he was initially reluctant to send it out to me because he was like, what a fucking YouTuber? Because at the time he was not familiar with the fact that I was an actual voice actor. But when I... Um, I remember, actually, when I sent him the auditions, uh, he sent me a reply right, right like back going, wow, that was quick, quick and he was visibly impressed in the email uh and you know when i talked to him later about it uh, after we had recorded he was like yeah like you know as soon as you i realized you're an actual voice actor i was like oh cool that's great flack is interesting because uh and i don't know how much i can talk about this specifically but uh the character in the, in the original sides was actually very different than how they are now um they were still like design wise they were still pretty similar but the, the character's sort of vibe was completely different, almost more theatrical. I don't want to say Shakespearean, but that was sort of like the route they were going. So my original audition was based off that, and then when I came in to record, uh, they were like, we've, re we've reworked the character, and now we're trying to figure out to solidify where we wanted to land. So that was an interesting experience, because I kind of walked in expecting one thing, uh, and it kind of getting turned on its head. And you know, this happens a lot in voiceover, where I'll come in sometimes with a preconceived notion, whether it's because I, uh, of the original audition, or maybe like the script, and going, okay, I think I, this is how the character's gonna sound, and then them going, nope, actually, we gotta change it. Uh, so this was, it was actually kind of an interesting experience to sort of figure out together with the writers and Joel, where is the voice for Flack? And where we sort of landed and discovered is Flack is like the perfect balance between Worf and Data uh, from Star Trek. Like, they are an absolute warrior, and they love, you know, the hunt, and they love to, you know, fight. But they're also very uh, kind of pragmatic and sometimes analytical. And so there was, it was this interesting, how do we convey, you know, something, that, something that's not too robotic but not too expressive. And I'm pretty happy with where we landed. So Flack, before post-processing, sounds like this. Very straightforward. Very, you know, definitely on the deeper end. Um, 
and just sort of a straight shooter. And I haven't played the game yet, but when I've listened to clips of Flag, I'm actually pretty pleased with how it's actually not as processed as I thought it would be. Uh, it's pretty close to the original voice, um, just a little robotic. But uh, otherwise, I'm 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 kind of glad that it doesn't get completely like changed. Uh, and I think a lot of my original voice does come through a bit. Sort of inspirations I had for myself with Fleck was kind of like a, almost like a calm Kratos from God of War. Very, very stern, but also very, uh, like, you know, not, not, not full of rage. Just, just sort of, um, almost cold and stoic at, uh, at times, but, you know capable of, exp of more expression when when necessary. There's this sort of hierarchy I have in my head of Flack, because at this point I've recorded a lot of Flack, and I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with the character, and it feels like a warm sweater I put on when I play Flack. Um, but my it, the hierarchy I have in my head in their priorities of what they think are important are uh, animals. Uh, they love animals. Uh, then it's the hunt, uh, you know, and being a warrior. Then it's fellow robots. Like, when Flack talks to, uh, like, Claptrap, or when Flack talks to robots in the game, uh, I, uh, it's, it's, like, definitely, like, on a level of, like, a peer. And I try to convey that in my performance and keep that in mind of, like, what if it's a robot? Um, there's a respect there. Like, hello, fellow robot. Um, but if it's, uh, below robots is humans. Humans are, like, eh. Take it or leave it. You gotta prove yourself to Flack if you're worth uh, their <laughs> um, uh, respect. And I kind of love that about Flack. Between sort of a warrior and uh, almost like a scholar, kind of. Like, because um, their background is, you know, an archivist, right? And they, you know, uh, always kind of like are processing human behavior like a, oh, is that how humans work? You know, that sort of thing. And so I try to fit them in between there. When they're in battle, they're, you know, they go nuts and they, you know, go crazy with the yelling. Um, but when they're just talking to people, um, there is this sort of cold analysis of like, what are you all about? I like that Flack isn't necessarily super over the top in their delivery of humor. It's kind of more of a dry, uh, sense of humor, and that's a lot of fun for me. Hi, I'm Ultrasam, the ultrasound machine. I've been programmed to comfort you. We tried to teach doctors empathy, but it didn't take. Nothing to worry about. She's just going to confer with some colleagues and check. Okay, let's cut the shit. I need you to plug in my wife. She's right over there. All right, next up is uh, Ultrasam. Now, I voice a couple characters in Tuca and Birdie, but definitely the most... Pr uh... Uh, prominent one in season one is Ultra Sam, uh, and this is definitely one of the closest performances I've done just to my regular speaking voice. Uh, obviously, the initial half is very polite and sort of Microsoft Sammy, but um, once he gets uh, serious, uh, that's pretty much just my voice, um, which I kind of love. I was requested by Lisa uh, to come in uh, for that, and I'm very grateful for that. I uh, love working with her, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of the show. I, I love Tuca and Birdie. I was also very pleased that Ultra Sam gets the last line in the first season. Uh, I wasn't expecting that. They actually brought me back in for that session, and that was like the one line. And, th and then they had me do like, um, I think like the caroling kid and stuff, but it was a very short session. It was like five minutes, but it was just because they were like, well, we wanted him at the end. Uh, and I wasn't even sure if they were going to keep it, um, but then when I finally sat and watched it, uh, the after credits had him, had him in the, as the last line, and I was like, that's great. I, I, I was very proud. Uh, one question somebody had about Flack, uh, is, uh, if the voice is post-processed, does it affect my performance? And the answer is no, I don't think about it at all. I just, uh, instead of worrying, I don't think about that at all, and, and just in the performance I go, they're robotic, and that's going to influence how I purport, portray them. And then the post-processing will just make them sound even more robotic. But I am already thinking about, I focus on how I perform it and don't worry about the post-processing at all. You'll never win with an attitude like that, Gran. Get rid of it. 
and anything else that holds you back. No shame in this defeat. You've got the edge as far as swordsmanship and agility. I'm just more durable. Vasaraga is a really fun character to play. Um, I, th I love that uh, he looks like this giant terrifying guy. But when you play or when you listen to like his dialogue, especially to like characters he knows in Grand Blue Fantasy Versus, he's a really pretty nice supportive guy. I love that about this character. Vasaraga's voice is around here, so try to bring a little bit more of the gravel in there sometimes. But uh, uh, the difference between that, Zeus is more, more regal, more this kind of thing. Uh, Basaraga is a little less worried about sounding like that. Just more straight shooter. And then Flack is more... a little flatter, because they're more of a robot. Zeus is up here. Flack is more... without the regalness. Sort of flat, like this. And Basaraga is definitely below that. A little more gravelly, a little more of a bad boy sort of voice. All deep-voiced characters that all have a sort of imposing sort of voice, but I I definitely approach them in, in very different ways. So with Vasaraga, uh, I definitely keep that in mind that he is not like a edgelord. He's a, he's a strong dude, and he knows it. He's not afraid to, like, you know, kick your ass. But he's also kind of like a mentor to some of the characters and he's like weirdly supportive like just like you don't you don't expect that you think he'd just be this crazy evil guy but he's just like kind of a nice dude and that's definitely something i keep in mind with the performance uh i do love the original japanese voice actor uh fumihiko tachiki uh, i think his work is great i think in my initial audition i tried to copy that voice more but what was kind of nice about grand blue was they gave you a lot of freedom actually and because uh, in some in some games uh or in you know in anime you listen to the original japanese and then you do your line uh but with grand blue uh in a lot of sessions i actually did not listen to the japanese it was just the dialogue and aside from timing which was important uh you have to like get it within a time frame which that was a that was a whole nother thing. Like, especially battle lines, it'll be like this Excel sheet of like, okay, Basaraga lifts his scythe, swings it up in the air, swings it down. 1.2 seconds. It's like, all right, got to do that in that time frame. And it, and it oftentimes became a game of like, how can we shave this down? How can we shave it down? We got to match the original timing. How can we match it down? Because in a fighting game, it's very important. But in story mode and in a lot of the sort of the character back and forths, uh, yeah, I, uh, I actually didn't listen to the Japanese. And the voice sort of became my own more interpretation of the character, as opposed to me trying to necessarily copy the Japanese. And again, my favorite thing about this guy is that he's nice. If he were just like a big scary guy, that's fun to play too. But that extra dimension of, like, he's kind of like your gruff dad, but if your dad was a terrifying, got huge warrior guy, that's just way more fun to play. Ahoy, I be Daros, a simple man of the sea. Avast, I haven't the patience for this. I owe everything to Prince Marth. He was never one to cast me off. Daros and Fire Emblem of Heroes, uh, this was a lot of fun. Um... I uh, was recommended to audition by uh, the voice director Patrick Seitz, uh, who I know. And I actually auditioned for a couple characters, but Daros was the one that I uh, ended up booking. Now, I have not played Shadow Dragon, uh, or the original game that he's from. Uh, so I uh, did kind of do a little bit of research onto like who he was, but he's just kind of like a nice sailor guy. <laughs> Like, if you really break him down. Um, so it was just sort of a way anchor. That sort of, uh, hey, I'm, um, I'm, I'm honored, Prince Marth. This sort of very genial sort of uh, big, big guy voice. I was definitely surprised at how, people, how excited people got 
uh, about that character specifically. Like, I wasn't anticipating uh, Daro specifically getting such a big fuss. And I, I realized part of it was because I voiced him. Um, but people people loved this guy. And I was like, I'm just glad I hopefully did him justice. And then the artist uh, uh, of, the, of his art in the game did a drawing of me. And I was like, this is just fucking awesome. Like, I... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big Fire Emblem fan, uh, getting to do a, uh, a voice in a Fire Emblem property uh, is, you know, dream come true. I mean, how I, and working with Patrick Seitz is always a pleasure. So, yeah, no complaints there. I had a great time. Hey, fellow. Nice to beat you. Better watch out. I'm catching up. Guess I better go fast then. Well, well, well. I was blurried for a second, but you all actually made it out of the maze. Dinner time! Chili dogs! Gotta go home! Yeah. The blur from Craig of the Creek is such a fun character to play. I do enjoy uh, kind of playing characters who are in that higher range. So the blur is around here, you know, this sort of... Kind of like Johnny from OKKO, OK but a little more grounded, and uh, but still a big shit eater. It was funny, I think I saw a comment on one of my videos I posted of that character, and they were like, oh, it sounds like um, they like processed his voice differently to make it, and I was like, no, that's, that's just me. I am capable of doing higher voices, amazingly. The blur was fun because uh, when, when I received the script for the character, they asked me to come in, and they did not have, kind of like KO, they had no preference on how the character would sound. And I'm actually very proud of the fact that a lot of stuff I improvised is in the episode. Uh, ben Levin, who is one of the creators of Craig and uh, is the voice director for the show, is very open to improv. Uh, so he'll go, do you have a better, like, you have a funnier take or, you know, anything you can tweak on this? Um, he's always very encouraging of that. Um, so when I, you know, saw the character uh, and the lines, I was like, you know, I'm just gonna make him a Sonic knockoff. Like that's to me, like my you know, this is my version of that. Hey, what's up? <laughs> uh, I definitely, I'm pretty sure I was the one who came up with the blur puns. Uh, there's a chili dogs line in there. Gotta go, gotta go home! That was also me. I wasn't expecting most, if not any of it, to be kept in, and almost all of it was kept in. And yeah, that was really fun because I went in and kind of comp took a character that I think they weren't sure about what to do with, and completely turned it into a way where uh, I think they were all, everyone was very happy with it, and the character kind of became this whole different beast uh <laughs> and it's he's just this ridiculous gremlin now and i love it and the final character i've picked for this video is hyodo from agretsuko who maybe my favorite character i've voiced so far just in terms of the character i adore this character um i was a huge fan of agretsuko um, before, uh, booking Hyodo. I had actually auditioned for characters in season two, uh, but I'm really glad I booked Hyodo. And I auditioned for a couple of characters in this season, but Hyodo was the one I wanted in my heart. And when I booked it, I was so, so thrilled. Hyodo's like my voice, but completely matter of fact. Matter, just all business. That's it. Unless he gets really excited. Then he gets a little ramped up. But um, uh, it's me just sort of not only listening to the original Japanese, which is also very kind of cold and uh, um, sort of grounded. But what I love about this character is there's so many facets to him. Like, he gets really, really angry and passionate about things. There's really funny scenes with him. I love his first scenes because he's so scary and I really tried to play that up. Uh, when you first meet him, and then that shift to, like, he's just this wild, kind of crazy guy, and then, uh, like, later he's, like, a kind of almost like a, a caring sort of mentor, in a sense, to Retsuko in some, in some ways. I don't know, just so, 
There's so much I got to do with the character, and it was just wonderful. What's interesting about um, Hyodo as well is I think uh, if if I had, because it's one where you you listen to the Japanese and then you you perform, and I think if without Patrick Seitz who directed that, I think I, my tendency would have been to go maybe flatter with the character because the original Japanese is a pretty flat sort of tone, but uh, Patrick actually encouraged more of um, you know give him a little more little more energy here or a little more um uh personality in this in this reading or you know he can afford to be a little more a little more and i think it actually was uh great i think that was a great direction on his part and i give i you know i uh fully you know give kudos to him for his direction that kind of helped sort of uh shape it as i went along because sometimes like you know I would do a, I'd do a take and, in, you know, I think it would be, I guess, quote unquote, closer to what the original sounded like. Um, but uh, I think Patrick was encouraging to, like, you know, kind of make it a little bit more your own and a little more, you know, you can afford to make it a little more expressive. Now, I'm very happy with how Hyodo, that's sort of where Hyodo ended up. Like, he still, I think, maintains the spirit of the original performance, but it still feels like something I can call my own as well. And I think that's a good thing to aim for in dubs. Um, I think a lot of fans want like a carbon copy of the original Japanese. But as an actor, that's not necessarily something you want. Like you don't necessarily only want to parrot something somebody else has done. What you want to do is take it at least this is just from my perspective anyway. You want to take that performance and capture the, you know, intent of the character and the emotions and everything. But, and, I, you know, if they sound similar, you know, I try to sound similar, but I don't want to just do only an impression. Like, I want to still feel like I am the character, you know, and in that sense, it become you give it a little of my own energy, not focus only on... I gotta make sure it matches exactly how the Japanese sounds, uh, and and focusing on the performance itself. I think that uh, is where I think most dub actors would like to land with their performances. Well, that was a lot of talking. Uh, yeah, I, I hope this was at least somewhat interesting uh, to you people out there. Uh, maybe I'll do more videos like this in the future with other roles I've done. Uh, there's definitely a lot of stuff coming that I can't talk about yet that or that I would be very willing to talk about in future videos. Otherwise, yeah, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.